Thank you. It's a pleasure and an honour um, to be here. My thanks to the board for inviting me. Uh, and my thanks also uh, for allowing me to speak in English. Um, whether that's an expression of cultural diversity, cultural conflict or cultural engagement, I'll leave you to decide. Um, I'm not a heritage professional, I'm not a policy maker. I have, however, thought for many years about concepts such as diversity, identity, belongingness, and the problematic ways in which we think and use and conceive of these concepts. And so what I want to do is not to talk so much about heritage or heritage policy, but to take a step back and to unpick many of the concepts that underlie heritage thinking and which are often taken for granted. Let me begin with a striking phrase used by Melanie Jolie, the, the new Minister for Canadian Heritage in Justin Trudeau's um, recently elected administration in Ottawa. The Ministry of Symbols. That's how she described her portfolio. What kind of symbols? Not the ones promoted by the previous Conservative uh, government of Stephen Harper, but, in Jolie's words, symbols of progressiveness. For Jolie, the job of a heritage minister of the state is to reimagine the, the nation in a particular way. And it sums up to me a particular kind of way of thinking about heritage, a means of presenting the past in a way that helps define the present from a, a particular political or moral perspective. It's an approach that has become increasingly important as societies have become more diverse and debates about history, ideas, um, identity, belongingness have become more intractable. But it's also an approach that seems to me to diminish and devalue the lived experience of history, heritage, belongingness and identity. And that's part of what I want to talk about today. Consider, for instance, two debates in two cities on either ends of Europe. Cordoba in Andalusia in Spain and in Istanbul. Cordoba's mosque cathedral is one of the most glorious buildings, not just in, in Spain, but in Europe. Now, it was about 20 years since I was last there, but I can still vividly remember the, 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 uh, uh, the experience. You walk through, I remember walking through the, the courtyard of the orange trees, and then almost as if they change form, they give way to um, a rows and rows of red and white columns, the arches that signal the start of the mosque. And the transition is stunning, as is the mosque itself. It's, it's not something that you can describe in words. It's something that you need to experience, the, the sense of spaciousness and, and peace that, that the mosque brings. And then as you walk through, there comes another transition to a Renaissance cathedral that squats like a, a familiar stranger within. It would be difficult to call the cathedral beautiful, but there's something quite remarkable about it. And the mosque cathedral is an architectural expression of the complex, intricate story of Europe. And for some, that's the problem. In recent years, the cathedral chapter of Cordoba, the, the branch of the Catholic Church that ministers the site, has slowly wiped away the word mosque from the, from the monument's title and from the publications about the site officially calling it simply the Cathedral of Cordoba. The official brochure describes the site as really Christian and that Cordoba's Muslim period was but a footnote to the city's Christian history. The story, as you might imagine, is much more complex and much more interesting. The first Muslim armies came to Iberia in the first decade 
of the 7th century. And Cordoba, the, cam- the, ca- the capital of Anna- Al-Andalus, had become by the 10th the most important city in Europe. In a way, the most important city in the world, rivaled, I suppose, only by Baghdad at that time. The heart of the city was the mosque or mosquita. And the caliph, Abdul Rahman, purchased the church of St. Vincent to be able to erect upon it a mosque to rival those of Mecca and Baghdad and so on. And in return for which Christians got permission to rebuild another one. The original mosque is a, a remarkable architectural hybrid fusing the artistic values of East and West, adopting Roman and Visigoth techniques, and including elements previously unknown in Islamic religious architecture. And it was not just a religious house, it was also Cordoba's university, one of the great centres of learning in the world. And the mosquito was held in such high esteem, even by Christians, that when it was reconquered in 1236, the Christian army did not, as it would normally have done, destroy it. It became a house of Christian worship. But for three centuries, the main architecture, the main structure, was left untouched. Then in the 16th century, King Carlos V gave permission to the church authorities to rip out the centre of the mosquito and construct a cathedral. When he visited, and Carlos V visited the uh, completed cathedral in 1526, it was, I think, he was said to have been shocked by the damage wrought on the mosque. You have built here what you or anyone else might have built anywhere else, he said, but you have destroyed what was unique in the world. And yet, it has also given us something quite unique as well. And it's the story of construction and destruction and the complexity of the relationship between Islam and Christianity and the complexity of Christian history that the very stones of the cathedral embody. 3,000 kilometers away, there's at the other edge of Europe stands Istanbul. And at the heart of Istanbul stands another remarkable building, the Hagia Sophia. Istanbul once occupied the same role in Eastern Christendom as Cordoba played in Western Islamic Empire. And Hagia Sophia was to Istanbul as the mosquito was to Cordoba. And in Istanbul today, a similar debate is taking place over the fate of Hagia Sophia, a debate that in many ways is a mirror image of the debate about uh, the, the cathedral mosque in Cordoba. The current church that we know as Hagia Sophia was built on the ruins of two previous churches, and it was commissioned by Justinian, the, the last Latin-speaking emperor of what was then the Eastern Roman Empire. It took just five years to build, but it's a remarkable, remarkable building. Five years is extraordinary when you think that Notre Dame, for instance, took a century to build. And it's a remarkable building at once the, the culminating achievement of late antiquity and the first masterpiece of Byzantine architecture. A building that casts an enduring shadow on the Eastern Orthodox Church, on the Catholic Church, on the Muslim world, influencing the development both of architecture and forms of worship. Hagia Sophia became first the, the seat of the Orthodox pa- the, the Patriarch of Const- Constantinople and the spiritual heart of the Byzantine Empire. And then when it was captured by the Ottomans in 1453, Constantinople was renamed Istanbul, the name Hagia Sophia was Islamicized, and the cathedral itself was turned into Istanbul's first imperial mosque, eventually boasting four minarets. And then after the fall of the Ottoman Empire in 1922, and the abolition of the Caliphate two years later, and the establishment of the secular Republic of Turkey, the church became a museum, and Worship, religious worship, was forbidden uh, to, to, to reinforce the idea of, of Turkey as a secular nation. Now, there's a campaign to turn Hagia Sophia back into a mosque, a campaign 
that, as you might imagine, by the AKP, the ruling party in Turkey. But for many Christians, of course, that would be sacrilege. And Greece, which sees the monument as part of its own historical heritage, has condemned the idea as an insult to religious sensibilities of millions of Christians. So here are two cities at opposite ends of Europe, two buildings symbolic of the continent's complex history, two debates that expose the fractious nature of the contestation of culture and identity. Two debates that attempt to rewrite the past, to create symbols on which to buttress a particular view of the present. In the one case, the Catholic Church, attempting to establish the idea of Europe as a purely Christian continent. On the other, the AKP, trying to reinforce a sense of Turkey as having Muslim rather than secular foundations. And it's against this background, really, that I want to discuss the issue of the meaning of heritage in a diverse society. We often imagine, particularly in Europe, that it is contemporary globalization and immigration that have transformed our societies, making them more plural, <coughs> and hence creating fractious debates about identity and belongingness. Immigrants, we imagine, bring along with them their own histories and identities and cultures that don't belong to the nation or identify with its past, as in the indigenous population does. And so, the argument goes, we need to think about history and heritage in a new way to accommodate that diversity. I want to question many of the assumptions that lie behind that approach. The very structures of Cordoba's Cathedral Mosque and of Istanbul's Hagia Sophia reveal that complex, messy cultural interactions are not new, but have deep roots in European history. And, that, and the dispute swirling around the two extraordinary buildings suggests that it's not simply immigration that has made the debates about history and identity so heated. That's not to say that globalization and mass immigration have not had a major impact on European societies, nor is it to say that the impact of globalization and immigration have not, has not transformed the ways in which we think of culture and identity and heritage. Rather, it is, the, it is to say that there is more to the question of a fraught sense of identity and belongingness than simply a greater movement of people's ideas and goods. What is equally important, I want to suggest, is the political and social context in which this great, greater movement takes place and the ways we have come to imagine the meaning of diversity, identity, culture. When we talk of heritage, we're not simply talking of the reality of one's past or one's origins. We're also talking about how one perceives that past or those origins. Perhaps no concept reveals better the gap between perception and reality than that of diversity. We imagine Europe used to be homogenous and that immigration has made it diverse. And much public policy, not just in Sweden, everywhere throughout Europe, is shaped by this assumption. But is it true? When I was a child, the Ghanaian-born American philosopher Kwame Apio recalls, we lived in a household where you could hear at least three mother tongues spoken every day. Ghana, with a population close to that of New York State, has several dozen languages in active use, and no one language that is spoken at home or even fluently understood by the majority of the population. So why is it, he asked, that in America, which seems so much less diverse than most societies, are we so preoccupied with diversity and inclined to conceive of it as cultural? It's a question, I think, that is even more relevant for Europe. 
When we talk about European societies as historically homogenous, what we mean is that they used to be ethnically, or perhaps culturally, homogenous. But the world is diverse in many ways. Societies are cut through by differences, not only of ethnicity, but of class, gender, faith, politics, and much else. But all that's ignored when we talk about diversity. Many worry today of the clash between Islam and the West, and fear that Islamic values are incompatible with Western values. We assume that that's a new clash, and that such fears are new, the product of a Europe made diverse through mass immigration. Yet the way that many think of Muslims now was how many, especially in Northern Europe, used to think of Catholics. We, we forget that now, but they were perceived in the words of the historian Leo Lucasen as representing an entirely different culture and worldview, and feared because of the faith's global and expansive aspirations. I'm not talking about Islam, I'm talking about Catholicism. And as such, they were denied basic rights, often mercilessly persecuted. In Britain, for instance, not much over a century since Catholics were for the first time allowed to vote, to enter Parliament, to enter many professions. Jews, of course, were seen even more of a threat to Europe's identity, values, and ways of being, so much so that they became victims of the world's greatest genocide. But the treatment of Jews as the other was not confined to Germany. It was a central theme in most European nations, from the Dreyfus Affair in France to Britain's first immigration laws. The 1905 Aliens Act, which was designed specifically to keep Jews from entering Britain. Europe was rent not just by religious and cultural, but by political conflict too, from the English Civil War to the Spanish Civil War, from the Germans' Peasants' Rebellion to the Paris Commune. Of course, we don't think of these conflicts as expressions of diversity or of a diverse society. Why not? Only, I would suggest, because we have a restricted notion of what diversity entails. And yet, even within that restricted notion of diversity, our historical picture of European societies is mistaken. We look back on European societies and imagine that they were racially and ethnically homogenous. But that's not how Europeans of the time looked upon their societies. Consider, for instance, a speech in 1857 by Philippe Boucher. He's a French Christian socialist, an important French Christian socialist of the 19th century. He wondered how it could happen that, and I quote, within a population such as ours, races may form, not merely one, but many races, so miserable, inferior, and bastardized, that they may be classed below the most inferior savage races for their inferiority is sometimes behind, beyond cure. The races that caused Boucher such anxiety were not immigrants from Africa or Asia, but the rural poor in France, the social and intellectual elite in France, far from viewing their nation as homogenous, regarded most of their fellow Frenchmen as racially alien. The same was true in Britain. Here's a vignette of working-class life in East London that appeared in the 1864 edition of the Saturday Review, which was a, a well-read liberal magazine of the time, and was typical of 19th century attitudes. The Bethnal Green poor, the article explained, Bethnal Green, for those who don't know, is, is an area in East London. The Bethnal Green poor are a race of whom we know nothing whose lives are of quite different complexion from ours, persons with whom we have no point of contact. Distinctions and separations, like those of English classes, will always endure, will last from the cradle to the grave, prevent anything like association or companionship, and offer a very fair parallel 
to the separation of slaves from whites. We don't imagine that that's how Britons or Frenchmen or indeed Swedes would have looked upon their fellow human beings, their fellow countrymen. We imagine that this is all, these were all homogenous societies, but that was not how it seemed at the time. Modern Bethnal Green lies at the heart of the Bangladeshi community in East London. And today's Bethel Green poor, the Bangladeshis, are often seen as culturally and racially distinct. But only those on the fringes of politics would compare the distinctiveness of Bangladeshis to that of slaves. The sense of a partners, I'd argue, was far greater in Victorian England than it is in contemporary Britain. And that's because in reality the social and cultural differences between a Victorian gentleman or, or factory owner on the one hand and a farmhand or a machinist on the other were greater than that between a white resident and one of Bangladeshi origin living in East London today. However much they may view each other as different, a 16-year-old teenager of Bangladeshi origin living in Bethnal Green, or a 16-year-old of Somali origin living in Stockholm, or a 16-year-old of Turkish origin living in Berlin, probably wears much the same clothes, listens to much the same music, watches many of the same TV shows, follows the same football club as a 16-year-old white teenager in that city. The shopping mall, the sports field, the iPod, the Hollywood film, all have served to create a set of experiences and cultural practices that in reality is actually more common than at any time in the past. And yet we think of our societies as impossibly diverse. None of this is to say that immigration has not had a major impact on European societies, or that public policies should not take account of the changes that immigration has wrought. But we need to recognize that the conventional narrative that underpins much policy, that Europe used to be homogenous, but has been made diverse by immigration, is both facile and false. A form of historical amnesia always seems to creep in when we discuss questions of diversity, social contestation, and cultural conflict. The questions of what constitutes national values, or who belongs to a nation, or how to imagine a nation's history, have always been contested. The discussion of how, diversity, how the diversity created by immigration should be addressed is the latest, but probably the sharpest, expression of a historically long-standing issue. Whether or not contemporary Europe really is more plural than it was in the 19th century is a matter for debate. What is unquestionable is that today's Europeans perceive their societies as more diverse. The question we need to ask ourselves then is not simply what policies do we need to accommodate the diversity of European societies, but also how should we engage with the perception that European societies are so diverse? And to begin to answer that, we need first to answer the question that Kwame Appiah asked. Why is it that Western societies would seem so much less diverse than other societies in reality, if you come from outside of the West? How is it that those societies are so preoccupied with the question of diversity and inclined to view it as cultural? There are, as one might imagine, many reasons underlying that perception. One of the most important is the way that the understanding of what constitutes significant social divisions or makes for a diverse society has transformed. A century and a half ago, social differences were cast largely in terms of nation, race, and class. Class in particular was the frame within which social interactions were understood. It may be difficult to conceive of now, but even racial differences were seen then 
as the speech from Philippe Boucher that I quoted suggests, or, or, or the, or the um, article in the Saturday Review suggests. In terms of class or social distinctions, the other for 19th century thinkers came not from over the border, but inhabited the dark spaces within those nations. Over the past few decades, the centrality of class has eroded in European politics, both as a political category and as a marker of social identity. At the same time, culture has become increasingly important as the medium through which people perceive social differences. The shift from class to culture is part of a, a wider set of changes. The broad ideological divides that have characterized politics for much of the past 200 years have eroded. The old distinction between left and right has become less meaningful. Old forms of collective life, usually based around class, have weakened. In politics, universalist perspectives have receded, and particularist ones have gained ground. The market has expanded into far more areas of social life and personal life than used to be the case in the past. Institutions that traditionally help socialize individuals from trade unions to the church have become less powerful. And as a result, we live today in much more fragmented, atomized societies. And partly as a result of such social atomization, people have begun to view themselves and their social affiliations in a different way. Social solidarity has been defined increasingly, not in political terms, but in terms of ethnicity, culture, or faith. Again, we imagine that this is something that's always been the case, but if you just go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you'll see that the way people thought about social affiliations was, was very different. The question people ask themselves is not so much what kind of society do I want to live in, as who are we? The two questions are, of course, intimately related, and any sense of social identity must embed an answer to both. But as the political sphere has narrowed, as mechanisms for social change have eroded, so the answer to the question in what kind of society do I want to live has become shaped less by the kinds of values or institutions people want to struggle to establish than by the kind of people they imagine themselves to be. And the answer to who are we has become defined less by the kind of society we want to create than by the history and heritage to which we supposedly belong. The politics of ideology, in other words, has given way to the politics of identity. And it's against this background that Europeans have come to view their nations as particularly diverse. These changes have been fueled by, and have been fueled, and have fueled another transformation, a transformation in our understanding of culture. Culture is one of those words that seem indispensable and yet also almost impossible to define. After all, what exactly is a culture? What marks its boundaries? Why should cultural differences be viewed as more salient than, say, class or age differences? In what way is a 16-year-old boy of Swedish, Swedish-born boy of Pakistani origin living in Stockholm of the same culture as a 50-year-old man living in Lahore? Does a 16-year-old white boy from Stockholm have more in common culturally with his 50-year-old father than he does with that 16-year-old boy of Pakistani origin? And so on. And such questions have led most contemporary anthropologists to reject the idea of cultures as bound, fixed entities. And some have come to question the very concept of culture. Since the concept of culture has become so multifarious as to obscure rather than clarify understandings of the social world, Thomas Harland Erickson has said, it may now perhaps be allowed to return to the cultural pages of the broadsheets. But if anthropologists 
have become increasingly wary of the concept. It has become for policymakers and for the public almost a social necessity. Culture has become the primary medium for which we define people and understand differences between groups. The key gauge by which individuals locate themselves in the world. A cultural view of the world has become so embedded in the way we think about ourselves and our relationships that it's easy to forget how new such a view is. The anthropologist um, Margaret Mead, in her memoirs, observes that in the 1930s, the notion of cultural diversity was to be found, and I quote, only in the vocabulary of a small and technical group of professional anthropologists. Three quarters of a, three quarters of a century on, what has changed is not just that culture has become indispensable to the vocabulary of just about everyone, but also how we conceive of it has transformed. At the risk of grossly oversimplifying, there are two broad ways I want to suggest we can think about culture. One is to view culture in the singular, the other is to view culture in the plural. And at the risk of even grosser oversimplification, one can call them enlightenment and, and romantic perspectives on culture. That's, it is gross oversimplification. The history, as anybody knows, the history is far more complex than that. But for, for the purposes of this talk, that will do. Enlightened philosophers talked about civilization rather than of culture. And through that notion, they expressed three key ideas. First, they saw cultural civilization as a single phenomenon, an expression of human universality rather than of human differences. Second, they understood. I ought to add that, that it became an expression of human differences through the concept of race, that certain groups were incapable of civilization, were racially inferior. But that was a, was a change that, that came towards the end of the 18th century, in particular the 19th century. I'm talking here about the notion as it first develops. Second, they understood it as transformative, as an expression of human agency. And third, it expressed their belief in progress, technological, moral, and social. The romantic view of culture, developing through the late 18th, 19th centuries, was directly in response to many of these beliefs. Romantics saw not a single civilization, but a plurality of cultures, each rooted in a particular people's history, culture, myth, stories, language. Culture, therefore, was an expression of differences, not of universals, and of a putative past, not of a, a potential future. The philosopher who perhaps best articulated that romantic vision of culture was Johann Gottfried Herder. Herder rejected the Enlightenment idea of that reality was ordered in terms of universal, timeless, objective, unalterable laws, and that rational investigation could discover these. He maintained, rather, that every activity, situation, historical period of civilization possessed a unique character. And what made each people and nation, or folk, Unique was its culture, its particular language, literature, history, and modes of living. And the unique nature of each folk was expressed through its folks, guys, the unchanging spirit of a people refined through history. Every culture was authentic in its own terms, each adapted to its local environment. Of course, in reality, we always have to view culture from both perspectives. Culture expresses a universal human ability, but one that's always expressed within a particular form. Increasingly, however, both professional anthropologists and society at large have come to view culture through the prism of the particular. The anthropological idea of culture, developed in the late 19th century, primarily by the German-American scholar Franz Boas, and largely in response to racial anthropology, drew heavily on the romantic view of culture in the plural. 
So today, that's the popular view of culture and that which guides politicians and policymakers. And we can perhaps best see that when we look at the idea of multiculturalism. It's become common to describe any European society made diverse by immigration as multicultural. But the idea of multiculturalism all too often conflates two notions that are crucial to keep apart. On the one hand, the lived experience of diversity. On the other, the political policies which are used to manage such diversity. The term multiculturalism embodies both a description of a diverse society and a prescription for dealing with that diversity. And that's a problem, because what it does in conflating these two notions is to turn diversity into the problem that must be solved, and solved by multicultural policies. In reality, multi diversity has become a problem because of the very policies designed to manage it. Policymakers have all too often sought to manage diversity through the public recognition of cultural differences and by putting people into ethnic and cultural boxes, defining individual needs and rights by virtue of the boxes into which people have been put and using these boxes to shape public policy. The irony is that multiculturalism is a set of political policies undermines much of what is valuable about diversity as lived experience. When we talk about diversity, what we mean is that the world is a messy place, full of clashes and conflicts. And that's all for the good, because such clashes and conflicts are, are such messiness, are the stuff of political and cultural engagement. Diversity is important, not in and of itself, because it allows us to expand our horizons, to compare and contrast different values and beliefs and lifestyles, to make judgments upon, upon them, decide which we like, which we don't, which may be better, which may be worse. It's important, in other words, because it allows us to engage in political dialogue and debate that can create a more universal language of citizenship. But in placing minorities into ethnic and cultural boxes, what multicultural policies, as I said, a policies do, is make more difficult such dialogue and debate. The very thing that is valuable about diversity, the contestations that they bring about, that it brings about, is what too many politicians and policy makers fear. Another of the ironies of multicultural policies is that while such policies are rooted in the notion of society being diverse, they are at the same time blind to, often to the diversity of minority communities. On the multicultural map, diversity ma magically ends at the edges of the minority communities. Multiculturalists, multicultural policies, tend to treat minority communities as if each was distinct, singular, homogenous, authentic, whole. Each composed of people all speaking with a single voice. Each defined primarily by a single view of culture and faith. And in so doing, they all too often ignore conflicts within those communities. The dissent and diversity of those communities all too often get washed out. And as a result, the most progressive voices in those communities often get silenced as not being truly of that community, or truly authentic, while the more conservative voices get celebrated as community leaders, as the authentic voices of minority groups. One of the reasons for the blindness of many multiculturalists to diversity within minority communities is a narrow vision of what diversity comprises. Because diversity, our vision of diversity, is confined to differences of ethnicity or culture. So it's easier to ignore other forms of differences within minority ethnic or cultural groups. And to think of such groups as homogenous simply because they are ethnic or cultural groups. 
Equally important is that policymakers have bought into a, a romantic Hadarian view of culture. Let us follow our own path, Herder wrote. Let men speak of our nation, our literature, our language. That is enough. Multiculturalists today would speak of community rather than nation. But the sentiment is the same. One of the most important reports of multiculturalism that has influenced policy in Britain was the Parekh report, chaired by the political philosopher Bhikkhu Parekh. And it defined multiculturalism, it defined Britain as a community of communities. To see what, where such a perspective takes us, or can take us, consider the work of the Canadian philosopher Will Kimlicker, perhaps the most important cogent philosopher of multiculturalism today. He's a highly subtle thinker, an unswerving liberal. In his book, Multicultural Politics, Kimlicker makes a case for the rights of cultures to protect their unique characters from changes wrought from the outside. It is right and proper, he argues, that the character of a culture changes as a result of the choices of its members. But while it is one thing to learn from the larger world, he insists, it is quite another, and I quote, to be swamped by it. That's a very telling phrase. For the fear of being swamped has long been a right-wing trope, used to whip up fears about immigration and about the other. Margaret Thatcher, when I, when I was growing up in Britain, Margaret Thatcher talked about Britain being swamped by alien cultures. Many Front National politicians in, in France have done the same. Here's Alain de Benoit, one of the founders of the Nouvelle Droite in France, appropriating the rhetoric of much contemporary radicalism. Will the earth be reduced to something homogenous, he asks, because of the deculturalizing and depersonalizing trends for which American imperialism is now the most arrogant rector? Or will people find the means for the necessary resistance in their beliefs, traditions, and ways of seeing the world? The current hostility to refugees coming to Europe it's often shaped by a fear of being swamped by people of a different culture, a different faith. If the romantic vision of culture buttresses the argument of both multiculturalists and of nationalists, it also shapes much of the discussion about heritage. The United Nations, for instance, has long advocated that indigenous communities should, and I quote, retain permanent control over all elements of their own heritage. Heritage being defined as all of those things which international law regards as the creative production of human thought and craftsmanship, such as songs, stories, scientific knowledge, and artworks. The 2003 UNESCO Convention for Safeguarding of the intangible cultural heritage broaden this approach to envision the creation of state folklore boards, protection boards, that would, and I quote, register works and authorise their use, and could intervene if native art was used in, quote, culturally inappropriate contexts. UNESCO is particularly worried by the inability of states in a globalised world to control the cross-border flow of ideas images and resources that affect cultural development. The World Intellectual Property Organization has developed a protocol for groups, particularly indigenous groups, to own property rights to traditional knowledge and to cultural expressions. If that knowledge or those expressions have some linkage with the community's cultural and social identity and cultural heritage, and are, I quote, authentically of that community, the aim is to prevent, without the free prior informed consent of the relevant community, the misappropriation of such heritage. Expressed in all these 
reports and conventions and protocols. It's the classic romantic view of culture and knowledge. The notions of a relevant community, of authentic belonging, and of culturally inappropriate context are both illusory and dangerous. A relevant community can be constituted only through a circular argument. For instance, some Muslims regard the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad as blasphemous and hence to be prohibited. To depict the Prophet should, in their eyes, be regarded as culturally inappropriate. Other Muslims see no problem in that. There is, in fact, a long, many traditions within um, uh, the Muslim faith um, which have celebrated the, uh, the production of images of, of Muhammad. You only have to go to a, to, to, to a mosque in Iran to, record, to see um, uh, images of, of Muhammad on the walls. But only the former, those who think it should be forbidden, are seen as authentic Muslims, while the latter, those who are relaxed with it, are seen too often as too liberal or too westernized to belong to the relevant community. This is Herder's vision of the Volksgeist, remade, molded into 21st century language. The Danish MP Nasser Hader tells of a conversation with the editor of Politik and the, the liberal Danish newspaper critical of the cartoons, the Muhammad cartoons. The editor claimed that the cartoons insulted all Muslims. Hadda replied that he wasn't insulted. But you're not a real Muslim, was the response. You're not a real Muslim. Why? Because what is a real Muslim has already been created, has already been established by society outside. Back in the 1930s, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote a, an essay on, called Anti-Semite and Jew, I think it was called, where he makes the point that the authentic Jew is created by the anti-Semite. Karim Miske is a, is a French um, filmmaker, um, writer, uh, novelist. He makes a similar point about today, that the idea of the authentic Muslim is created by Islamophobes by society outside. Because from a, such a perspective, to find, to be, to be a reactionary, to find the Danish cartoons offensive is to be a proper Muslim. Anyone who isn't reactionary, who isn't offended, is by that definition not a proper Muslim, not part of the relevant community. And here it seems to me that liberal multiculturalism meets right-wing anti-Muslim bigotry, because the same image of what it is to be a Muslim is expressed in both. Culture is our entry ticket into the world, a means of opening it up, of allowing us to engage with it and to expand our horizons. But too much policy-making, both at national and international levels, turns culture into a barrier a means of protecting people from the world. The consequence, it seems to me, is to be has to been to create cultural enclaves and intellectual bunter stands. And this is true even when policymakers try to create what they see as a common perspective in most European nations in response to the diversity created by immigration and to, to the growing sense of social fragmentation. There's been a desire to define national identity and a common core to the nation. Uh, it's a debate in Sweden, I think. Um, certainly debates in Britain, France, Germany, elsewhere. Immigrants, from this perspective, must be taught British values or French values or Swedish values. The government must craft statements that set out in the words of one recent British policy document, the ideals and principles that bind us together as a nation. What most politicians and policymakers ignore, however, is the sheer complexity, elasticity, and sheer contrariness of identity. 
whether personal or national, identities can never be singular or fixed because they are rooted largely in people's relationships to each other, not merely personal, but social relations too, and such relationships are always mutating. Identity does not come all neatly tied up in a bundle. My sense of attachment and belonging, whether personal or national, is shaped by the context. Who am I? Well, that depends partly on who wants to know. Who am I to my daughter requires a very different answer to who am I to a group of Swedish policymakers. There is only one me, but that one me expresses itself through myriad identities. Similarly, with national identity, I am British, but I'm not British in every context or in an uncontested way. I only have to visit a a London street to be reminded of how open Britain is to foods and goods and influences from all over the world. I only have to stand in a queue at Heathrow Airport to be, remember how deep is the suspicion of foreigners in the nation. There are many aspects of British life that I admire. There are many I despise. There are many British traditions that resonate with me. There are many I find abhorrent. There are many moments of British history that bring a lump to my throat. There are many that make me shudder. Many non-British traditions, too, have helped shape my views. And to raise this complexity within the myths of community or nation is to diminish the very notion of belongingness. Heritage policy should not be about creating the myths by which we live. That's not to suggest that myths may not be important to our lives. Just that it should not be the job of heritage professionals or the state to fashion them. Heritage professionals should be neither gatekeepers nor symbol formers. Rather, they should see themselves as providing the tools through which people are able to define themselves themselves. Their job, it seems to me, is to create a space for social conversation and indeed for conflict and contestation. One of the consequences of the peculiar notion of diversity we possess today is the fear we have of disagreement and conflict. But conflict is a necessary part of social life. Values, ideals, identities are always contested and necessarily so. The problem today is not the existence of social conflict, but the means through which it is expressed. Because so much public policy has sought to protect people from the world by creating cultural enclaves, so conflicts have become more intractable and less negotiable. We sit in our silos and shout at each other. And that's why we need to reject both the nationalist and the multicultural approaches to heritage. Nations and communities comprise many traditions, many values, many visions of the future. Far from fearing this, we should encourage the clashes between traditions and values and visions. In many ways, we're all, each of us, like the Cordoba Cathedral Mosque or Istanbul's Hagia Sophia. We're each of us complex constructions, each with many identities, influences, and social, and, uh, social sources of heritage. But the way in which we're often regarded, and indeed, the way we often regard ourselves, is like the way the Catholic Church views the Cathedral Mosque, or the Turkish authorities view Hagia Sophia a singular with all the complexities washed out, and a symbolic of a myth we want to present to the world about our roots and who we are. Unlike the buildings, however, humans have agency. We're not simply constructed, we construct ourselves. Our sense of who we are, where we come from, where we belong, what our values are. And we construct our, ourselves through debate, dialogue, contestation, 
and yes, conflict. What heritage policy making should be about, it seems to me, is not having that debate for us, it's not creating the symbols, it's not forming symbols, it's not reimagining a nation in a particular way. It should be about using the past to provide the tools and the space that allows us to have that debate in the present. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Now, please stay on. I uh, shall invite onto the stage for a brief conversation about what we have just heard from our hosts at the Heritage Board, Kesar Mahmoud. Welcome. I shall leave you in Kesar's capable hands. We, we are supposed to sit over there. Are we? Kelly. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I will do what I'm told to do. Me, same here. Uh, Kenan, thank you for your ideas. I think they were both interesting but also challenging. Uh, and it may be provoking to some, I'm, I'm not sure. But, but one thing that struck me uh, and that I'm a bit puzzled over is uh, why do you think that cultural heritage is, is, is an area of controversy and, and, and conflicts? Because you can see that there's a trend in Sweden as well in other European countries that uh, both those who want to create an uh, inclusive society, an open one, use cultural heritage. But, but on the other hand, those who want to create an exclusive society, they use also cultural heritage. I think it's partly because, and there are many reasons for it, but it's partly because we do sit in our silos and shout at each other. We have created, we think of ourselves in very narrow ways. We have our own you know, sense of identity are uh, in, 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 very, in increasingly parochial ways. Well, one, one of the changes that has taken place over the last 20, 30, 40 years is that broader sen a broader sense of identity has given way to much more narrow parochial sense of identity. When I was growing up, even before I was growing up, my parents, mm. there's, a, there's this notion now of, of the Muslim identity, of Muslim communities. Well, when I was growing up, no such thing existed. My parents, they came to Britain in the 60s. They were pious. Uh, my, my, so my father was Muslim, my mother was Hindu. And people you know, um, raise an eyebrow when they hear that. It was fair, very normal 50 years ago. Um, they were pious, but um, they weren't particularly... Uh, they didn't wear their religion on their sleeves. Uh, you know... The men drank, they went down the pub, they weren't ostracized for that. You wouldn't see a hijab, let alone a, a niqab, a burqa, um, uh, in, in, in those communities. Um, they attended mosque when it suited them, you know, when the Friday feeling took them. But they, weren't, they saw themselves as good Muslims. Mm. I grew that's up. That's my way of being a Muslim. Yeah, isn't sure, it? that's right. I mean, it, for, for many people, it still is. Mm. But you know, I grew up in in, in, a, in, in a in in a society in which we didn't think of ourselves um, as Muslims or Hindus or Sikhs. We might have thought of ourselves as Asians. We actually thought of ourselves mostly as black, because black was a political identity, not an ethnic one. Today, however. Muslims, the notion of being a Muslim has become so narrow that it means having all those symbols of Islam, reading, uh, uh, attending mosques regularly, saying prayers regularly, um, wearing hijab, wearing the bird. Now, if people want to do that, that's fine. I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. You know, that, that's their decision. But the point, point I'm making is that the notion of what constitutes a Muslim has become very, very narrow. Similarly, with every other identity, it's become much narrower than it used to be. And, so, and, and the reason for that is, is that it's part of what I was talking about, that the broader political changes that have taken, the political and economic changes that have taken place, that have created a more fragmented, um, atomized society, that have eroded more universalist perspectives, 
that have eroded its possibilities of, um, of thinking about social change, social transformation. Um, and that have made culture the medium, rather than, say, politics, the medium through which we engage with the world. Mm. All of those things have, have worked together, if you like, to narrow our sense of identity. And therefore, we think of ourselves in terms of who we are, of our history, our heritage, and our past. Um, and inevitably, that creates conflict, and creates conflict that is intractable. The point, I, was, I suppose, I was trying to make is that the problem isn't conflict. Mm. Conflict is inevitable, it is important, it is uh, necessary. But, but what, what I was probably wondering is... Sorry, is I was going to say, the problem yeah. is, is the character of that conflict. Mm. And because we, we, we become much narrower in the way we think of ourselves and our identities, those, those conflicts have become much more intractable. As I said, we just mm. sit in our silos shouting at each other. But what, what, what I'm wondering is about is that uh, the concept of cultural heritage seems to be that elastic, that, that you can use it uh, whether, the, whether you have a, a small, a, a narrow view of culture or the plural one, right? So, so you can read uh, culture um, through two perspectives and, uh, and use it. I read somewhere that you said that uh, cultures are not private properties, right? Uh, and that they should belong to us all. And I was wondering, uh, could you apply the same idea to cultural heritage? I mean, should we be talking about human heritage rather than national heritage or world heritage? Well, we all have particular histories to which, particular traditions to which we feel attached. There's nothing wrong with that. that you know, that's how we locate ourselves in the world. You, you can't simply locate yourself. If you say, I'm a human being, that's it. You locate yourself in particular histories, in particular traditions. Um, but those are very complex. Um, how, you don't locate yourself. What, what, what I was trying to say is that identity isn't a singular thing. It is, depends on context. The, work, the kinds of histories and traditions in which you locate yourself depends on the context. Um, when I'm watching sport, I'm very English. You know, I uh, support the England football team. I support the England cricket team. God help me, I support the England rugby team. Mm. But outside the sporting arena, English and Englishness means nothing to me. It's in that one context that, that, that I am English. I am British. But Britishness is not an identity for me, it, it, it is my passport. There is the traditions in which I locate myself are actually tr political, historic, social traditions, not necessarily British. There are certain British traditions in which I do locate myself. Um, there, are, you know, there, there are those traditions that have, uh, if I think about the British past, for instance, traditions that threw up the levelers or the chartists or the suffragettes, not the traditions that throw up Cecil Rhodes or the Black Shirts. I mean, there are many traditions within the British context. So the point, point I'm making is that to say I am British and see that as something fixed is meaningless mm. because the notion of Britishness, the notion of my identity is always contested. And I want to be part of that contestation. But you can't be part of that contestation unless you locate yourself somewhere. I locate myself in a particular place because I have certain values, political beliefs, and so on. And those are the traditions that shape me and locate how I want to define my identity and the identity of the society I want to live in. So it's important. To, I'm not suggesting that histories and traditions should be just thrown out of the windows. They're important. But we should not see them as fixed, narrow, um, singular entities. We, 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 we inhabit different identities. We inhabit different traditions depending on the context depending on the question that's being asked of us. So the, so the challenge for the uh, cultural her heritage policymaker is to provide tools that can be used both for the human, cultural heritage, world, n nation, and, and local one. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not a heritage professional, so I wouldn't want to sit here telling you how it should be done. What, what, what I'm suggesting, though, is that, that Heritage should not be seen as a means of creating a myth that lessens conflict in society. It should be seen as a way of, 
of facilitating conflict, but conflict in the sense of the contestation of values and beliefs and lifestyles. Um, because it's only out of that, 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 it's only out of that contestation. You can call it contestation, you can call it debate, you can call it dialogue, but it's only out of that that we begin to, begin to understand ourselves in a more universal fashion. Um, and that's the irony. We, we think that, that the way to, 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 to um, lessen our kind of narrow, parochial way of looking at the world is, is to eliminate conflict. It isn't. The way to, 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 to do it is actually to engage in, 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 in those differences and, 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 and divisions, uh, differences in, and, and um, contestations. In, um, but you have to be, do it in a way that, where, where you can talk to each other. Part of the problem is that the kinds of conflicts we have are conflicts where we don't talk to each other, where you know, I am this thing, you are that thing, and never the twain shall meet. Um, I think the job, not just of heritage professionals, but for um, all of us, is to create the conditions in which we can discuss and debate um, in a way that makes sense. Thank you, Kina Malik. Thank you very much.